Bun găsit la emisiunea Știință și Cunoaștere! Peste câteva momente vom avea o legătură directă peste ocean cu profesorul de biologie, dr. Bruce Lipton, care în acest moment se află în California, Statele Unite. Foarte pe scurt o să fac câteva precizări. Domnul profesor Bruce Lipton este cercetător în domeniul biologiei celulare și a studiat la Universitatea Virginia din Charlottesville, obținând un doctorat, iar apoi a predat cursuri la Departamentul de Anatomie a Facultății de Medicină de la Universitatea Wisconsin. Dr. Bruce Lipton a realizat clonarea celulelor STEM în cadrul unei cercetări legate de distrofia musculară, focalizându-și atenția asupra mecanismelor celulare. A pus bazele unei tehnici experimentale de transplant de țesut alături de colegul său, dr. Ed Schulz, publicând un articol în revista Nature despre ingineria genetică. În prezent, dr. Bruce Lipton își prezintă teoriile și noua sa înțelegere asupra biologiei către publicul nespecialist și este recunoscut cel mai mult prin cartea și DVD-ul aferent numit Biologia Credinței. Noi vom vorbi în limba engleză, dar traducerea va fi subtitrată în limba română. Hello, Dr. Bruce Lipton. It's a real pleasure to meet you again on this second program over Romania from TVR Cluj. Well, uh, Christian, I want to tell you, I, I wish I was back in Romania because uh, it, it was one of the most wonderful visits I had uh, when I went to Europe. And uh, I miss the people. They were so wonderful and loving and, and they love the new science, which I thought was great. Maybe you'll return someday. I, I wish to do that because I didn't go to the mountains and I really want to go up uh, uh, into the mountains. Okay, that's great. And we have a nice forest nearby Cluj called Forest of Baciu, which is very famous. Uh, I would love to visit. Yeah, okay, okay. And the Botanic Garden also. It's uh, unique in Europe. Well, I'm coming back. <laughs> I look forward to meet you here. Okay, uh, I had selected only 19 questions from those 33 initially found on your web. And I said that uh, because it's a lot of story to tell. And uh, maybe the rest of them we will discuss within another program. Well, you know, let's uh, let's get the ones that you're interested in because uh, I'm sure the conversation will expand. Okay, okay. So the first one is what is spontaneous evolution and if it is anything like spontaneous remission? The, the, uh, the book was called Spontaneous Evolution just because it is like spontaneous remission, meaning Uh, a patient is sick and dying and everyone thinks this person is going to die, the doctors and the family, and all of a sudden they get healed, remarkable healing. And, um, and it really has to do with uh, the, the common character of a spontaneous remission uh, is that there's a big change of belief on the part of the patient. Rather than thinking about dying, they start thinking about, no, I want to I wanna live, I want to have a good life, I want to have some fun, and all of a sudden their life changes. And so it's basically when the belief changes, uh, then the healing comes. And why I call the book uh, Spontaneous Evolution is because we are in a process of evolution right at this minute. This is what we see all around the globe, uh, the Arab Spring. Uh, the Occupy Wall Street, uh, all of these changes politically in every country, the economic crisis, all of these are showing us that we're facing an evolution. And just like in a patient, uh, it doesn't take millions of years to do an evolution. If we as a population, if the human population changes its belief system, then just like a patient that changes the belief system, then when the human population changes the belief system, the world will change instantaneous. So uh, it's, it's not going to be an evolution dragged out for hundreds and hundreds of years. It'll happen within the next few years. It'll be a whole change in the planet. And this is 
uh, what the crises that we face today are all coming to. It says we cannot continue living the way we've been living on this planet because that has been the cause of the problem, uh, the way we are destroying the environment. Yeah. So it says we have to think different. We have to behave differently. We have to have a new vision. And this is what's happening all around the world at the same time. So we are actually beginning the evolution right now. And in the history books, they'll go back to this very time and say this was the spark that changed the evolution of the planet. And so this is a most important time for humans on this planet because we're in a place where we have to make a choice. It's our choice. <laughs> if we don't want to change the way we're living, then we will go extinct. But if we do change the way we're living and live more in harmony with nature, then we will have a spontaneous remission or a spontaneous evolution. So let's return now a little to the four myth perceptions of the biology and uh, please tell us what are they well uh, the 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 story is is that in our world today we look to science to provide the truth so we want to know if something's true or not we say is it scientific and so therefore science is the judge of what is true about the earth and things that we should know how to live on the planet. Well, there are four different beliefs that we have been living by as a civilization, these beliefs of science, and we create a world based on these beliefs. And it now turns out these four beliefs, which I'll mention, uh, these four beliefs are wrong. And by continuing to use these beliefs to, to guide our lives, we are going into destruction. So this is the most important time to recognize we have been living by some m false belief and that we have to change our life with the new science. Yes, please describe them. Okay. Uh, the first belief is that uh, we believe we live in a, in a physical universe where everything is made out of matter and physical stuff and that this is based on uh, Newtonian physics that says uh, you can look at the universe and you can just look at the physical part. So if you want to look at a body, you look at it as cells and chemistry and genes. Uh, we look at the world and uh, all the physical things. And that physics, Newtonian physics, does not give any emphasis to the invisible world. The invisible world of energy, uh, that's not covered in that physics. The new physics, which is not new anymore, <laughs> came in 1925, and it's called quantum physics. And quantum physics turns the table and it says, there's a material and an energy world. And actually, the material world is made out of energy, so the whole universe is energy. And, but what's important about quantum physics is, quantum physics says that the energy, the invisible world, is what shapes the physical world. So that the invisible energy around us is actually changing the physical world. And it's interesting because uh, if I say, uh, what's this energy called? And physicists call the invisible energy around us, they call it the field. I say, what is the definition of the field? And the definition is, the field is invisible moving forces that affect the physical world. And I, and I say, well, okay, that's right. The invisible forces affect the physical world, and they call it the field. And I say, it's the same definition that spirit is. Spirit is invisible moving forces that affect the physical world. So we left spirit out of the equation. Sometimes is used uh, the term zero-point energy. Zero point energy is talking about the, 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 the source of the energy that's in the background of all of this. Well, we look at each other and see a physical body. This is not real. The, the, the reason what you see, it looks physical, is because the light, the light bounces off the surface and then, and, and so you see a reflection of energy. Uh, the human body 
is made out of atoms. Okay, I say, yeah, but what quantum physics showed was that if you go inside the atom and say, what is the atom made out of? Quantum physics shows that the atom is made out of invisible energy. So I say, well, atoms are energy. And I go, yeah. And I say, yeah, but atoms make molecules and cells. I go, yeah, but then those are energy. And cells make humans. And we are energy. And so you say, but I can see you and touch you. And I go, yeah, that, you can see me because the light bounces off. In the dark, you can't see me. <laughs> and then I say, but it's physical because I can touch you. And I go, a tornado, a big windstorm, a cyclone. Uh, if there's a tornado and you, you try to drive your car through a tornado, you can't drive the car through a tornado because the force of the wind is so strong, it'll just crush the car. So the, the issue is, so is a tornado physical? I say, no. Tornado is energy. It's a spinning, spinning energy, a force field. And I go, an atom is a nano tornado, a micro tornado. That's what an atom is. So you can't put a car through a tornado. You can't put your hand through a tornado. You can't put your hand through me, even though I'm an energy, because all my atoms are miniature tornadoes. So we have to change our vision. And this is what the new science says. We kept thinking everything was physical. But it turns out, no, everything is energy. And energy at any level affects energy at any other level. So invisible energy is affecting the energy that looks physical. Okay. And uh, about the other myth? Uh, and now the next myth is a, a revolution. The next myth is we have believed for the last uh, 60, 70 years that genes control our lives. And, and you say, yeah, genes control the traits that I have. And I go, well, the genes are, are molecules like blueprints to build a building. The genes are blueprints to build a human being. And, and then you say, but my character is controlled by my genes. That's what we said. And, and then I say, well, wait, did you pick the genes you came with? And you say, no, I, I didn't, uh, you know, that just happened between my mother and father. The genes came together and here I am. And I say, but if you don't like your traits, if you don't like the things you inherited, can you change them? And I say, no, you can't change them. And so what do we believe from that science? And the answer is that we believe that we are, we are controlled by our genes, that our fate is determined by our genes, such as cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, obesity, all these different kinds of diseases, we say genes cause them. That's the old belief. There's a new belief, and it's, it sounds almost the same. Uh, genetic control is the old belief. Genetic control means control by genes. The new science almost sounds the same, but it's a revolution. It's called epigenetic control. That little epi in the front, the E-P-I, means above. So when I say epigenetic control, what I'm saying is control above the genes. And all of a sudden you say, well, what controls the genes? Ah, our mind. And this is the new science because it says if you change your way you experience life, if you change your beliefs, if you, if you just change your emotions and attitudes, you change your genetics. And why that's important is the old story, genetic control, you're a victim. You're a victim. The genes control you. The new story, the new science, you're a master because you can change your genes by changing your belief, changing the way you live, changing your emotions. All of these can change your genes. And that's how you create disease because of your beliefs. And that's how you can heal your disease because of your beliefs. And that goes back to like spontaneous remission where a person is terminally ill and they change their belief and then all of a sudden they become healed. And this is going to happen uh, to the planet. And what we're going to learn is that we can do this to ourselves, that we control our health. So we go from victim to master 
of our health and our lives with the new science. Now, number three and number four, the two different, uh, the two beliefs that have been changed, or the number three and four beliefs, are very important because these are beliefs that shape the world that we live in. Belief number three that we have that is wrong is a belief in Darwinian theory. And Darwinian theory is, uh, uh, they summarize, uh, they say the, the theory is the survival of the fittest in the struggle for existence. This is the motto of Darwinian theory. It says that life is a struggle, that we have to go out there and fight each other to be a winner because if you don't win, you're going to die. And so basically it says that um, life is competition, that we compete against each other to survive because uh, the whole belief was the, uh, that we will reproduce too fast, there won't be enough food, and therefore who's going to get the food? And all of a sudden they say, the winner of the fight. <laughs> so we, for a hundred years, 150 years, have been engaged in competition, one person against another person, one country against another country, fighting against each other because of the belief, it's just a belief, that if we don't fight and, and, and get into the struggle and become the fittest, that we will die. It turns out that belief is wrong because it, it, we now know that nature is not based on competition. Nature is based on the complete opposite. Nature is based on cooperation. I wish to concentrate ourselves in this program more on about the differences between the new biology and the old academic science uh, because uh, we want to promote the correct science to, to the public. Yes. Okay, let, let me give you the last one of the four because it also relates to us. And the last one of the four is, according to Darwin theory, evolution was random, meaning that genetic changes were just accidents and that's how all the organisms got here. And so we, we don't see our connection to nature because we say, oh, the only reason we're here is just an accident of genetics. And it turns out, no, all the organisms that were created were created by nature to bring harmony and balance to the garden. Now, we'll, we can go back to the, the first two of the misperceptions. Number one, uh, Newtonian physics is now really quantum physics. And number two, the old genetics is now something new called the epigenetics, the new one. These change the whole idea of human health and human uh, uh, relationships. It's a very, it's a profoundly different change in science. So for example, what is the health consequence of the Newtonian physics, quantum physics change? And the answer is this. In a Newtonian world, we believe that you just have to look at the physical things, that we don't count the energy at all. So if you want to understand how a human body works, then we take the body apart, just like a mechanic takes apart a car and looks at all the parts and see how they work. This is what we did with the human body. We looked at it as a physical machine. We took it apart. We found all the chemicals and we found the genes. And then we have to say, we say, well, how, if the body is not working right, what's, how, where do you go look for the problem? And they say, well, it's just like if your car is not working right, some parts are probably broken. So when you look at the body as a, a vehicle, like a car, and it's not working right, then you treat it just like a mechanic at the gas station. You adjust the parts, and we, we use drugs. Uh, those are chemicals to fix the chemical body. So that we think that it's a physical body uh, only. We put chemicals in there to try to fix the body, and that's why we take drugs. And it turns out, the body is like a car. It is a physical car. It's got physical parts and molecules and chemistry. But what the story left out is there's a driver. The driver is invisible. It's, it's the mind. The mind is the driver of the vehicle, the car. And why is that important? Well, look, go back to the story of a car. If I give you my car and you don't have driver education, you don't know how to drive a car, then uh, uh, I give you the car. I'm sure you'll break the car, destroy the car, uh, because you won't know how to drive it. 
and then we'll, we'll have to fix the car all the time. And the fact is, if you learn how to drive the car correctly, then the car lasts a long time. Well, here's the problem. The body is like a car. It's like a vehicle. And our mind is the driver. If we don't give a mind driver education of how to drive the vehicle, then our mind could destroy the vehicle rather than keep it healthy. And this is the problem we face in the world today because up to now, science and medicine doesn't talk about the mind because it's invisible energy. And they operate by Newtonian principles that say, no, it's just the physical world that we have to look at. So they take the mind out of the equation. So they say, if there's something wrong with your body, it's because there's something wrong with the machine. That's the cause. And now we find out, no, the mind is actually controlling the, the biology. It's the invisible forces, your thoughts. And your thoughts are affecting your biology. And therefore, if you have thoughts that are not in harmony with your, with your life and are not in harmony with the cells in your body, you have thoughts that are out of balance. You have thoughts that are self-destructive. You have thoughts that don't support you. Those invisible thoughts are now found to change the biology in your body. And so all of a sudden it says, the old science says, oh, if there's anything wrong with you, it's just because the parts are breaking. And the new science says, no, if there's anything wrong with you, 90%, 90% of the time, it has nothing to do with the physical body. It has everything to do with your thoughts, with how your thoughts are driving the body, how your thoughts are causing damage inside your, your physical body, inside your, your, your mind, inside your whole, your whole uh, uh, interior of your body, your thoughts. And so we go back to a science that says, before I treat you with drugs and chemistry, the first thing I have to really look at is the relationship of your thoughts, your spirit, your mind. All of these invisible things are what are causing the issue of the, of the problems in your body. But and in fact, the pharmaceutical drugs are the, one of the biggest problems in healthcare today because the drugs are causing most of the uh, illnesses uh, and serious problems that we face. Yes, but uh, about that healing, how do you put my experience described in my published paper? Because it's a different approach from what you are speaking about using the bioresources, biotransformations and biological transmutations. Yes, well, this is absolutely, what you were doing was first, you were creating a thought, you were creating an intention, you had a, a mission, you were working on, I'm going to focus my thought on healing. And that is the beginning of the healing process, because you're setting up that invisible field, which the physics talks about, the thought is a field, it's shaping your body. So your work was focused on changing your body, changing your, your energy levels, and this is what the most important point is. I said, you're the driver. And for the, when you started to do the healing, you took control of the car. And you started to say, no, I want to drive it the way I want to drive it. I want this to be the result. And all of a sudden, you recognize how you change your life. You change the way you live. You change your thoughts. And guess what? Your body changed right along with your thoughts. So you are demonstrating the role of a mind as the driver of the vehicle and the role of the mind in, in creating the character of your own health. And this is what we want to return to people because the conventional medicine says you're a victim, that you can't do, you can't control your health. That's why we have to go pay the, the, the pharmaceutical company for all the chemicals and all the drugs. And, and that's what they have us believe. But that's not true. And, and the fact is, you can heal yourself better without the drugs. And, and you have demonstrated this uh, because this is the, the nature of your work. This is what you did. And the first thing you did, if you go back and think about it, is you made a commitment. You made a belief that I'm going to do this. And when you committed that, that's the driver of the vehicle putting your hands on the wheel and beginning to drive the car. 
And this is what people have to learn because most of them are like in the back seat of the car uh, thinking the car is driving itself, but they have to learn, no, they're the driver of the car. Yeah, and yes, you already, yes. you learned that. But uh, it was very, very difficult to accomplish because I did that at too older age. This means that uh, if someone accomplished this at 20 years old or 30 years old, then uh, it would have been much more easier. So for this reason, it was very difficult for me. Well, think about it this way. Uh, if you're 30 or 40 years old and you want to go skiing if the first time, it's very hard to learn skiing. If you're five years old and you go skiing, you can learn in one day, <laughs> you know? Uh, so uh, as we get older, it, it's harder to change the belief system a, a little bit because we've been, we make habits, a habit by repeating things. <clears throat> the more habits you have, the harder it is to, to change some of those habits. So younger people can change faster than older people sometimes, okay? Especially very young kids. But there's new ways of uh, getting control of our mind. Uh, there's new uh, psychology they call energy psychology, where you have uh, ways to get into uh, changing the mind much faster than ever before, uh, so that uh, there are new techniques to uh, make uh, the change faster, to give people uh, an opportunity to heal much faster using these new techniques. So you, know, <clears throat> you were a pioneer. You were back there changing uh, your life uh, without that technology. And it's, uh, as you said, it's, it was harder to change it back then. But uh, it's very important that we have to recognize that there are newer ways to do, to do this as well and faster because we're running out of time to change. We have to change very quickly to keep the planet alive. And your work was very critical because you, you have to have pioneers show the way. If you don't demonstrate the way, nobody will see it. And so your work was very important to showing, look what I can do with my life. Look, I have control over my life. And that's what people need to learn. So you become a teacher by demonstrating the power that you have. And that's why you play a very important role, uh, not just in Romania, but around the world, Christian, because uh, your work is uh, showing the power of individuals that they have over their lives. And, and as I said, most people think they're victims, but uh, you're teaching us a different way. Thank you very much, Bruce. But I didn't do very much, just a little bit, very little, I may say. Yeah, but you did enough to show people things that they didn't believe in. Yes, that's true. That, well, then you created new belief. Possible. Yes, and, and, and but my book is called The Biology of Belief, so belief is very important. <laughs> I did quote from your book as references in my paper. <laughs> well, you were, you were the example at, uh, of using that information, so that's what's important to me. Okay. How does cell communicate each other? Well, we used to think again, in a, or we still think in medical community that cells use chemistry, like hormones or, or uh, growth factors or neuropeptides. They think this is the only form of communication. But we now know because of quantum physics, y you can communicate with chemicals, but the communication is much more efficient with energy vibration like tuning forks or like a, like a broadcast from a radio station to a receiver. Uh, cells are, are sending uh, vibrations back and forth to each other. Now, when we talk, uh, the sound is a vibration. Uh, and so, but the cells talk to each other with vibrations at different, different levels of vibrations that we, uh, we can't hear those vibrations. But it's almost the same uh, as you and I having a discussion two cells can communicate with vibrations to each other. And now that becomes important because that's not chemistry. That's, that's quantum physics. And, and the relevance about that is the vibrations influence the genetics and the vibrations influence the behavior of the cells so that uh, we're beginning to recognize that rather than healing with chemicals and drugs, 
you can heal with energy and vibrations. Well, we knew this a long time ago, but in the world of Newtonian physics and modern medicine, they, they, they disregarded that whole thing. And, and the significance about that is that um, the, the result is we rely on drugs today. We rely on the pharmaceutical company today. And, and they don't want us to know about energy healing for a very simple reason. Energy healing doesn't cost any money. You don't have to buy anything. And, and so the drug company doesn't want to tell you you can heal yourself with energy because there's no business. Uh, and so medicine has been really controlled by the drug companies. Yes, you, you are correct. But there is one more problem with that. Even people know that they can heal themselves with energy. It is very difficult to do it. It is not the companies don't want to tell us. If even if they are telling us all, the situation is not changing very much. Well, uh, but this is what the biology of belief book focuses on, and it says why doesn't it change very much? And this is why, because when I talk in the book, I say the belief. There's two parts to the mind. The mind is where the belief comes from, but there are two parts to the mind. There's the conscious part and the subconscious part. And the difference is, the subconscious, when you say the word subconscious in English, sub means below. So when I'm operating from subconscious, I'm operating from below, I'm not, it's operating without my even seeing it. It's automatic. It's sort of like uh, if a, a, a ball is coming toward your face, you will blink your eye automatically. You don't think about it, it's just automatic. So it turns out, The reason we have problems is that the two minds don't work together <laughs> a lot. The conscious mind is our personal connection to spirit. Our conscious mind is our personal identity. The subconscious mind is almost like a tape recorder. It has habits. You learn something and once you learn it, you just push the button and it'll play it without you even thinking about it. So I'll give example. Uh, before you had a driver's license, you didn't know how to drive a car. Once you got a driver's license, you had to practice and you practice. And now you, you drive the car so much, you practice so much, you don't even have to think about it. So you get in the car, you put the key in, and you're thinking about where you're going to go and all that, but you don't pay attention to the gears. You don't pay attention to all that. It's automatic now. So it says, once you learn something and, it be, and you repeat it, It becomes a habit, but now it's in the subconscious mind. So here's the problem. The conscious mind has your wishes and your desires. When I ask you, I say, Christian, what do you want from your life? That's created. You create an answer. The conscious mind is creative. The subconscious mind is habit. It just plays the same habit. It doesn't create. Now, here's the problem. The conscious mind is creative. And that's the one that has desires and wishes, like, I want to heal myself. That's a wish. Uh, I, I want to be successful. That's a wish. Uh, I want to marry a wonderful person. That's a wish. I go, okay, that's from the conscious, that's what you want. But uh, now what we find out, we only use the conscious mind 5% of the time. That means 95% of our life is not coming from the creative wishes. 95% comes from the subconscious, the lower one. Okay, and I say, okay, great. But now here comes the problem. The fundamental or the primary habits in the subconscious mind, we learned them from our parents and our family and our community before we were six years old. By watching our family, we downloaded, just like a television camera. As a child, we're like a camera recording everything we see. And those habits that we see from our mother and our father, from our family, from our community, those habits are downloaded into the subconscious. So now I say, today, Christian, let's say you're 50 years old, okay, 45, I don't know, you know. 48, 48. I, I was close. Almost, uh, yes. Uh, I say, okay, but today I say, you operate 5% of the time with your wishes. You say, I want to be healthy, and a, a person out there in the audience says, yes, I, I want to be healthy, and I go, that's from the conscious mind. I say, that only works 5% of the time. What about the, where do the programs come from, the subconscious? They come from your family. 
If, if you have diseases and illness in your family, it's not because of the genetics. It's because of the behavior that creates the disease. It's driver education. Your habits drive your biology, just like, a, like an autopilot, an automatic pilot. The habits that are driving your life then are not yours. They come from the subconscious, which are other people's habits that you downloaded. So 5% of the time you work with your wishes and your desires, 95% of the time you work, work with the habits that you got from other people. And because it's subconscious, you don't see it. And that's why people have a problem in the world because they say everything's so hard. I want to be healthy. I'm, I'm trying so hard. And I go, no matter how much you try, it's only 5%. Because 95% is going to play invisible the habit in the subconscious which you got from your family. And, and so this becomes important because most people don't see the habit. They don't see themselves. Uh, and I, in my lecture, I, I, get, I tell a story. I say, I know sometime in your history you, you had a friend and you knew your friend's behavior. You knew your friend's behavior very well. And I said, but you also knew your friend's parents. And sometimes you recognize that your friend has the same behavior that the parent has. So you say, you know, Bill, you're just like your father. And, 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 and then people laugh because they know that as soon as you say that, Bill will go, how can you compare me to my father? And, and, and I tell it, and everybody laughs because they, they have experience. And I say, the joke is everyone else can see that Bill behaves like his father. The only one who doesn't see it is Bill. And I say, that's because it's subconscious. So when he's doing the behavior he learned from his father, he's doing it automatically without even seeing it. And the point of the story is we are all Bill. All of us are operating with invisible behavior. We don't see it. Now, wh where's the problem come from? As you mentioned just now before, and this is the point, you said it's very difficult to change. And I say, it's difficult to change because you're only using the mind that creates change 5% of the time. And 95% of the time, you're going to play the habit that you got from your family. So why, why is it difficult to change? Because you're not controlling it. You're letting the subconscious is still in control. What you had to do in changing your life, Christian, was you had to change so, the basic beliefs that you grew up with. You had to go back and change your mind over some of the things that you learned when you were younger and say, I'm not going to live that way. I'm going to live a different way now. And when you took power back and you changed the program to match what was in your conscious mind, then you started to create from your conscious mind. And that's when you created the life that you wanted. Yes, but, uh, you, you know, changing just the ideas was not a very tough problem. Well, it was in a certain degree, but not very tough compared to changing the physiology mechanisms, which made me very weak. I lost vitality. I did not have enough energy. This was the most difficult task to change it back, to get my health back, my vitality back and the energy, not just the ideas. I needed 16 years to work on that. Let me explain why it was so hard. Because some people think if I just, my conscious mind has a new idea, then my subconscious mind should have the same idea. And it's like, no, that's the problem. The conscious mind can have any ideas that it wants. It doesn't, the subconscious learns from habit. You have to learn it over and over and over and over again. That's what's in the subconscious mind. So if an idea comes into my conscious mind, a new idea, it doesn't change the subconscious mind. Uh, because the subconscious mind has to keep the same programs. Otherwise, the subconscious mind would change every day. It, it would be crazy. So the subconscious mind is habits. Habits don't change every day. So if you want to change a habit, then you have to do some kind of work to change the habit. The conscious mind is creative. You came up with, oh, this is a great idea. And I go, yeah, but it doesn't, that's not a habit. That's an idea. Then you say, where was the hard part? That's what you said. There was a the hard part. And I say, ah, the hard part, and I had to do this myself. Uh, you're not the only one. 
because when the new biology came across, I said, oh my goodness, uh, it's my ideas. Uh, and I said, I should be able to change my life. I have these new ideas. I said, but my life stayed the same. I said, what was the difference? I said, until you take the idea and make a habit, it won't work. So where's the job? And the job is, as you mentioned, the harder part was take the idea, but you have to force a habit. You have to learn it every day. You have to work on it because habit is repetition. How did you learn anything? You repeated it and you repeated it. Like when you learned the alphabet when you were a child, you didn't learn it the first time you heard the alphabet. How many times did you have to start over again? A, B, C, over and over and over again. You had to start and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. Was that work? Yeah. So uh, you have to do a, a, a process to take an idea from the conscious mind and put that idea into the subconscious mind. I still remember from my childhood that huge amount of effort to learn the multiplying table. And you had to repeat it, right? Yes. So it was so, so hard, so hard to do it. I never forget it. I never forget it, the experience also, not just a table. Well, I know, but see, but you see you and the same thing you just talked about with your own healing. You said the ideas came pretty easy, but to make it work, you had to do something. And it was just like the times table. You had to change an old belief because they don't change easy. That's what's important because that keeps us constant. If, if, if the subconscious mind stays the same, then every day you can get dressed without learning how to get dressed again. Every day you can walk without learning how to walk again. Uh, so the subconscious likes to memorize the, the, the program and, and you have to change the program. You've got to do something and that's what you call the hard work. Yeah. What is the difference between random and chaotic and why is it important? Okay, um, the, the word random means just by chance, something happens by chance, it's random, okay? And um, uh, chaotic is funny because from something that we look at and we say, oh, that looks random, it turns out in chaos, it might look random, but underneath there was an organization. And so random is no real organization and chaos looks like it's random, but there's really an organization behind it. Uh, I give a, uh, a demonstration you know, in my lecture. Now, I don't know if it'll work in Romania because we have a big train station in New York City called Grand Central Station. It's a big train station. And at rush hour, Uh, there's so many different doors for all the different trains, right? And you see the crowd of people, thousands of people, and they're, they're all moving around. And if you look at them, you think, oh, they're all just, you know, randomly moving around. The fact is, no, they're not randomly moving around. Everyone knows which door to which train they're going to. But if you're up at, from a balcony looking down, you think everybody's just random. And it's like, no, everyone's going somewhere. I say, what's random? And I say, In, a, in that station, when everybody's running around going to the train, you yell fire and fire. And what will happen is people will start to panic. And all of a sudden, now they're running. But where are they running to? Now it's random. And see, so they both look the same. But one, every, every passenger was going to a specific destination. Even though it, you look from the top, it looked like they were just randomly moving. But when you yell fire... Then all of a sudden, everybody started to run to anywhere, and, and there was that's completely random. So they both look the same, but one has order, and the other one is no order at all. And why is this important? Because when we look at the weather, when we look at the biology in the body, the physiology, we look at, so use the weather. Everyone says, oh, it, it, you know, the clouds or winds are blowing, it's all chaotic. It's like, no, there, you could actually you know, mathematically calculate all of all the movement. It's not an accident. Uh, and that's what that story of the butterfly flapping its wings, the butterfly flapping its wings in the tropics leads to a, a, a storm in the United States uh, because every little bit of movement is added up. And yet our minds can't do, I can't, our minds can't do the math. Our minds can't do it. So we look at it and from the distance, just like looking at the crowd of people, we say, oh, the weather is random. I say, 
if you could measure every little thing, like the flap of every little butterfly wing, uh, if you could measure it, then you would say, no, the weather's not random. There's the, the, this mathematical. And so the important part about our biology is a lot of people see it as random, that just things happen randomly. And it says, no, underneath there's an order. There, everything happens according to the plans. And if you understand that, then all of a sudden you can take what looks like a random biology, like why did I just get sick? It was just an accident. It's like, no, no. It was the way you were, you didn't see all the little moves you were doing. You didn't see how the thoughts you were having. All of them created that. So there was an organization. And why is it, what's the difference and why is it important? And the answer is this. If something is random, you can't change it. If something is chaotic, that means there's a control. And that means you can change and control chaos, but you can't control random. So when you look at the body and they say, oh, it's all chaos. And I go, hey, look, it is chaos, but it's still controllable. And this is what we have to come back. Our lives are not accidents. They're not random. Our lives are uh, in a state of chaos, which says it looks random, but underneath there's a plan. Okay. What was the Human Genome Project and why the results shocked the scientists? <laughs> well, when science finally agreed that genes control life, then they said, well, if we had a list of all the human genes, then anybody's problem, anybody's problem, we would be able to fix it with a new gene. So uh, if I wanted to get more hair, I could say if I knew the gene to make hair, I could, I could, you know, engineer that gene and then I could grow new hair. Uh, if I knew the gene that caused cancer, then I could uh, stop the cancer. Uh, you know, so people are saying, oh, if we knew all the genes, we could um, uh, control every character of life because genes control life. And if you could identify each gene, you can use them. So it was interesting because the Human Genome Project was actually uh, 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 started because of the pharmaceutical industry. The pharmaceutical industry said, wow, they, science expected to be 150,000 human genes to make a human biology. And to the pharmaceutical people, they said, well, every gene is going to be like a new drug. So if Christian wants to change his height, I could give Christian a gene to make him taller. Uh, maybe a music gene like Mozart. If you wanted to be like Mozart, maybe I could engineer for you a music gene. You know, this is all the belief that the genes control these things. So the drug company thinking, well, there are 150,000 genes, said, oh my goodness, that's 150,000 new drugs. And so they said, let's I make a list of all the genes and then we can use them to treat patients. So they were thinking about it to make money, not, not to help humans, but to make money in the pharmaceutical company. So that's what they started the project with. And the big surprise was science, according to the belief of the time, said it would take 150,000 genes to make a human body. When the results came in, there were only 23,000 genes. Well, what does that mean? It said, how, science said there had to be 150,000, there were only 23,000. It means science didn't know how the biology worked because the whole idea was wrong, because uh, there's 125,000 genes missing. Well, they're not missing, they just don't exist. And all of a sudden I said, well then how can science say there's 150,000 when we find there's only 23,000? And the answer is, science didn't understand how it worked. And we had a belief system that, that was wrong, that genes don't control life the way we thought they do. We now know that the mind can take 23,000 genes and create 150,000 different proteins from only 23,000 genes before they thought one gene makes one protein. And since there were 150,000 different proteins, then science said, well, there must be 150,000 genes. Now it turns out there's only 23,000 genes, but they make 150,000 proteins. So some genes make more than one protein. And it's like, well, that changes the entire belief system. And, and it removes the belief that genetic engineering is going to be easily accomplished because they didn't understand how it worked. But that failure, that mistake, 
is what took science off the understanding of how life worked. And that's why uh, conventional medicine is not that good at helping heal the human race because they still focus on the chemistry controlling the genes uh, and uh, they have a whole wrong idea how it worked. And now we know there's the mind and the mind controlling 23,000 genes is what creates the lives that we have. And how do we change the old story and write the new one, the correct one? Well, the most important thing, Christian, on that is to recognize that knowledge is power. And lack of knowledge means lack of power. The knowledge that we've been operating by has been wrong. And so basically, these four misperceptions we talked about earlier say that the, that knowledge is not true. It's, so it's a lack of knowledge. We have been operating without our power because we didn't know the new knowledge. So how am I going to give you your power back? And the answer is power is knowledge. I have to give you new knowledge. And this is why the science is so important because in the last 20 years or so, new knowledge has changed our complete understanding, which means the public has to get this new knowledge. It's not just for the scientists. The knowledge is used by the public. And if the public has the wrong knowledge, a lack of knowledge, then the public is being disempowered. And so the change of our civilization, the change of our evolution, why the world is coming to a new order is because new science is saying, we have been living incorrectly, and I'm going to give you a new science, a new knowledge, new power. And with that new power, you will take power over your life, and we'll take power bringing back the garden. And so we need the education. And education is the primary uh, uh, important goal of civilization. And that's why, for example, your work uh, is very critical, uh, Christian, is because you're helping change the education from an old belief into a new belief, from a disempowering state into knowledge that has more personal power as you express with your own life. And so as much as you change your knowledge to bring more power to your life, we have to change the knowledge of, of the civilization to give them more power so we can move forward. Yes, Bruce, but I did it on a very small scale and I am only one person here. Uh, but, but, but Christian, here's the whole idea. But there's a, a person like you in every country. There's a person like you scattered everywhere. We're going to learn from lots of people with the, you know, they're going to show us the same idea, but from all over the world at the same time. There's not just one teacher. There are lots of teachers because the population is 7 billion people. We, we can't depend on one teacher. We're going to have teachers everywhere. So each one of us, I do a part, you do a part, people in the audience listening to us, they will be doing a part. All of us have to recognize that the evolution is not from individuals. The evolution is a cooperation of all the individuals. And this is what we are beginning to learn. That's why the barriers between countries are going to fall apart. That's why uh, the world is starting to recognize we're all one thing. Uh, well, we see ourselves as individual people. It's like we are all cells in the body of something bigger called humanity. So like a human being, you look in the mirror and you say, oh, there's one human being looking back at me. And I go, we're not a one organism. By definition, we are made out of 50 trillion cells. The cells are the living entities and their community creates me. Well, in that same story, we ourselves as 7 billion cells but we are representing one bigger organism called humanity, and that is the evolution. Yes. Uh, only one minute remained, and uh, I, I thank you very, very much for this meeting. And it was very fascinating for me, and I hope it was also for our viewers. Well, as uh, good news regarding what you had said earlier, one small team of biologists from India are interested in my paper. Great. I saw the blog on that. It was really wonderful. As I said, you said, I'm just one small person. I said, look, your words are already in India. 
So think about that, how fast that happened, okay? And your words are spreading. And this is what the whole idea of the internet, the internet is the brain of humanity because it connects all of us individual cells into one giant organism. That's why your words in Romania have a change of people in India is because we can communicate around the world. So uh, even though you see yourself only localized where you are, your words are now becoming international, and that's how the world will change through this Internet. That's why uh, the upheavals in uh, uh, the Arab Spring, because the people were watching the Internet saying, but the rest of the world has all this stuff and we don't. And that's why it's connecting all the people to be in one world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And after broadcasting, I'll upload the program on the internet so everybody can see it. Well, I so appreciate your opp the opportunity because you're helping me get my words from the United States into Romania. And then from there, it'll spread like your word to, to other places as well. So uh, thank you for helping me be a, a teacher as well. I thank you very much, Bruce Lipton, and I wish you a very nice day, and uh, we'll meet again. I hope so, and I would love to see you in the forest. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Mai avem doar un minut până la finalul emisiunii. A fost o discuție fascinantă și mă bucur că am avut această ocazie de a sta de vorbă cu un expert de talie internațională. Sper că această emisiune va oferi nu doar o nouă perspectivă asupra biologiei, ci poate chiar o lecție de viață despre înțelegerea ființei noastre. Iar aceasta nu e doar o simplă apreciere din partea mea, ci vă pot confirma că am aplicat practic toate cunoștințele și teoriile domnului profesor Bruce Lipton și rezultatele nu au întârziat să apară. Aș vrea să închei cu o frază pe care am mai amintit-o într-una din emisiunile trecute și anume Dacă drumul de la sănătate la boală se parcurge extrem de ușor și fără efort, întoarcerea în sens invers de la boală la sănătate, mai ales în cazul maladiilor cronice vechi, este foarte greu de parcurs, necesită efort și pregătire multidisciplinară, cultivarea atitudinilor corecte față de mersul vieții și continua adaptare la condițiile de mediu și sociale. Mijloacele necesare vă stau deja la dispoziție. Fiți alături de noi, data viitoare, la o nouă întâlnire cu știință și cunoaștere.